We're half an hour away from the open in Hong Kong, Shenzhen, and Shanghai. You're watching The China Show. I'm Yvonne Mann. Asian stocks rising and bonds are under pressure following that blowout U.S. jobs report. Attention now turning to this week's CPI print for the next clues for the Fed. The PBOC's RMB fix also in focus today as mainland Chinese markets return from the holiday after the currency slipped close to the limit of its trading range. Plus, Janet Yellen prepares to meet the PBOC governor as her China visit advances ties despite tough criticism of Beijing's policies. All right, it's a big week when it comes to not just Asian central banks here in the region. We count at least four or five that are meeting this week, but also we're going to be on the ground at the HSBC Global Investment Summit here in Asia as well. David's on there in the field. We'll get to him in a little bit, but certainly the market action seems to be quite risk on here this morning, following what we saw with that red hot jobs report out of the U.S. on Friday. So you're actually seeing equities gaining on the back of that resilient day that we get out of the U.S. U.S. futures are still flat this morning. The dollar is slightly catching a bit here, but you are seeing some optimism around the Nikkei, the Kospi, uh, Taipei also coming back online after that holiday as well. Dollar yen not doing a whole lot, but certainly we're focusing a lot on the labor wage day that we got overnight, or just a few hours ago, I should say. Better than expected, you have a little bit more hawkish commentary from the BOJ, Ueda-san, talking about how, you know, the, the weaker yen could be a factor here and how they, you know, look at this policy decision moving forward. JGBs are not doing a whole lot here today, but we're watching this sell-off across Treasuries follow through in the Asia Pacific. You take a look at sovereigns in Australia, for example, continuing the sell-off that you're seeing. And we're seeing that sell-off play out here in the Asia session as well. We're basically seeing the entire Treasury curve back to those 2024 highs. So yields are ticking higher here once again. Is 450 the next line for the U.S. 10-year yield? That's what traders are eyeing very closely as we count down to that U.S. inflation print as well. And what does that mean when it comes to Asia FX with many Asian currencies are now at the lows of this year as well? We take a look at when it comes to A50 futures. Of course, that China reopened. So it's been four days shot. Markets are seem to be, at least stocks, could do, see a good day. But look at the renminbi very closely here today. That onshore renminbi on Wednesday, that fix was 709. I got this right now. 70980. So if we watch very closely, is it going to be close to that? Is it going to be stronger or weaker? It's going to really show whether we're going to see some massive support from the PBOC for the currency or are they going to continue to allow this sort of moderate depreciation, 725.05 for your offshore rate here this morning. So what to watch in terms of your agenda in greater China today, not just when that comes to the mainland markets reopening, a bit of catch up there, certainly a lot to fixate on as well. That remedy fixed, as I talked about. Sure, Mao, this breaking news came out in just about an hour or so uh, with CCB filing that winding up petition as well. So property developers very much in focus. There's been news on Country Garden hiring an advisor as well. Yellen in Beijing set to me as we talked about the PBOC. Liu He as well, the former uh, economic czar as well. So certainly a lot to watch. Commodity prices of course, uh, the ones that are listed in China whether we do see that catch up that we saw we're already seeing iron ore dahlia and futures down some 2% this morning and EV stocks as well. There's been a meeting with some of the uh, partners in Europe among some of these automakers. But we're watching everything from developers, tourism stocks, there's been some good holiday data coming through from the Qingming holiday as well. All right, I think we have David on the ground at HSBC. Dave, how's it going? Yeah, well, I think I'm here. There's only really one way to find out. There we go. Hi, Yvonne. Good morning. We're coming to you live out of the Global Investment. Uh, first one inaugural, of course, out of HSBC. So in fact, just taking place right behind me as well. So the, the festivities are going on in that door right behind me. Of course, there's an audience right behind me as well, watching through the live screen. Right now speaking is, is, is John Lee, of course, the chief executive. Right before him, we had Mark Tucker, of course, the chairman of HSBC, welcoming the crowd. And what's really become, you know, the timing, obviously, just coming out uh, of the Rugby 7. So 
a lot will be forgiven if they've had a little bit too much fun over the weekend. All that being said, in a couple of minutes, we'll be joined here and sent by Noel Quinn, of course, someone who does work at HSBC, of course, HSBC boss, to talk us through, of course, how the bank, how the bank is doing. We're approaching, of course, result season. Of course, a lot of other good conversations coming up here and set at the Conrad Hotel here in Hong Kong at the Global Investment Summit, inaugural one, of course, out of HSBC. So all the key themes that you talked about there, inflation rates, we'll be trying and featuring those, of course, into these conversations coming up. In the meantime, Yvonne, I'll send it back to you in the studio. All right. Yeah, as you mentioned, it's a big week for central banks. We're watching very closely what this RMB is going to do. We're keeping a close eye on that daily fix here today, just due in just a few minutes. That's after the currency slid close to the weekend of its allowed trading range last week. Let's bring in Stephen Chu, our Bloomberg Intelligence Chief Asia FX and Rate Strategist. He's with us here in the Hong Kong studios. What are we going to see with that fix today, Stephen? I think now market is super sensitive every day. So anything about above 7.1 they would take it as a signal that PBOC is letting the yuan to weaken. You can see from the CNH is actually above the allowable 2% band already, meaning that market thinks that the PBOC have to give in. But the thing is that given that the dollar is still very resilient, the Fed is still so far away. We've talked about it for two years. Like yeah. the Fed is going to cut, the Fed is going to cut, the dollar is going to slide. It has still not happened yet. And now we're seeing higher inflation again, stronger drop report like last week, meaning that now actually market has to move from three cuts to two cuts, or some people even talk about no cut at all. So China will be like waiting anxiously because they have been waiting for like a Fed cut, a weaker dollar, so that they can sort of like align the spot and fixing. That hasn't happened yet. So that's why for now to anchor market expectation, they will have to keep it below 7.1. Stephen, David here, I'm going to put you on the spot right now. If you glance on your screens right now, there's a dip in dollar China. I was wondering if you could help and indulge us what you think is behind this move ahead of the fix of the day, which you guys highlighting uh, is fairly key as we go into this week. Yeah, I think um, as the dollar stays strong, it will be increasingly hard for the PBOC to justify keeping fixing at below 7.1. So meaning that going forward, market will keep speculating, so China may have to throw out more measures. Of course, we know about all the dollar selling onshore from state banks, offshore as well from state banks, and there's also like a box of two box that PBOC will, will use. It has used it last year, it used it the two years ago. It may have to use all of the tools again in the second quarter if the UN continues to be put under pressure. Okay, it's not just RMB though, right? We have a board, I'm going to show just really most Asia FX has been pummeled by this stronger dollar story. You take a look at when it's the, the Thai bot, for example. You take a look at what we've, we, let's show the EMFX side of things. Korean won, Indian rupee after that RBI decision. Uh, yen, certainly, we don't have to talk about that. The peso, we have the BOSP coming up as well. I mean, what's really going to be the most vulnerable? among the Asia FX trade now. Yeah, I think we've said this like over and over again now. In a strong dollar world, in the high USD world, the high carry currencies, the high euros will be better placed. So that's why when you look at the UN, why was it like so weak and so being watched at? Of course, it's China. But another reason is because China is still cutting rates. It may have to cut rates further. And now like among Asia, of course, Taiwan is still like the, the bottom of the pack. But then you can see the UN actually from a carry perspective is actually dropping down the table. So that's why, of course, all of the Asian currencies are under pressure, but the yuan is actually facing more pressure compared to the high yields. All right, Stephen Chu, thank you. Our Bloomberg Intelligence uh, FX uh, rate strategist here. You take a look at when it comes to what we're seeing, right? So we mentioned about that 709.80. That is really key here today. And as, as Stephen mentioned, you know, anything above 710 might show a big signal here today. Let's get to the geopolitics now. We have U.S. Treasury Secretary Jenny Yellen set to meet with PBOC Governor Pango Shen today before wrapping up her China visit. She sat down with the Premier Li Chang on Sunday and says relations between D.C. and Beijing are now on a, quote, more stable footing. As the world's two largest economies, we have a duty to our own countries and to the world to responsibly manage our complex relationship and to cooperate and show leadership on addressing pressing global challenges. Currently, under the strategic guidance of the two presidents, China-U.S. relationship is stabilizing. Madam Secretary, you are the first American cabinet member to visit China this year, and your visit has indeed drawn a lot of attention in the, in the society. Our news desk editor, Jill Desis, is with us now. And, you know, she's seen as the good cop among the Biden administration. She really used that to her advantage, but also used that to test 
this relationship as well over the weekend. Yes, uh, Yvonne, it's been a really interesting weekend for uh, Janet Yellen. This is her second trip to China in the last nine months, probably her last in this term as Treasury Secretary before the general election in November in the U.S. Uh, what we saw her do is really press China on issues of overcapacity. Uh, this is um, a big criticism that the U.S. has really been hammering over the last several months in particular, this idea that China's flooding uh, the global market with really, really cheap goods. Um, the, the, we've seen this also from uh, Europe as well, really attacking uh, China over um, subsidies for EV makers, that kind of thing. Um, but ultimately, this did seem like a pretty diplomatic meeting for uh, Janet Yellen. She didn't get a whole lot of um, really official pushback. We saw in state media um, probably the most criticism toward Yellen on some of these uh, these lines. But ultimately, yes, it does seem like they want to keep up um, pretty good uh, diplomatic relations heading into the election in November. And, and how have those comments gone down? in China. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, you did see uh, Xinhua, so the official news agency in China, really blast her on uh, Friday, criticizing these comments about overcapacity. We've also seen um, from the China side this idea of, hey, wait a minute, like, you're going to attack us for uh, subsidizing our in industries. What about the U.S. subsidizing chip makers, that kind of thing, sort of nodding uh, to some of the efforts that U.S. lawmakers have undertaken in recent years to kind of bolster uh, semiconductor industries. Um, but ultimately, I'd say, overall, does doesn't really seem like there's been uh, an incredible line of attack. I think really playing into that, what you what you said earlier about Yellen being the good cop among the U.S. administration. It seems like you know she has actually engendered quite a bit of respect uh, from policymakers in China. So what we're expecting a few more meetings today um, with the PBOC governor. Liu He, which I found quite interesting, the economic czar. Yes. Uh, so actually, despite the fact that Liu He no longer has, you know, one of those big formal vice premier titles, um, he still is an incredibly influential member uh, of, um, you know, Xi Jinping's uh, uh, a group of, uh, of governance here. I mean, Liu He obviously played a tremendous role for China uh, during the U.S.-China trade war under the uh, Donald Trump administration. So it does seem like he continues to advise, uh, you know, China on a lot of these big economic matters and is certainly part of the equation here. All right, so got a seat in the table. Jill Deese is there. Thank you so much. Our senior editor joining us here in our Hong Kong studios. And Dave, you know, obviously we're going to be talking about geopolitics. I'm sure that's going to be something on the agenda there at the HSBC Global Investment Summit. Well, you know, part of the description, interestingly enough, of course, uh, as the summit progresses, of course, is having these frank conversations around how to navigate all these changes, right? So, in fact, just on that very note, so John Lee is now speaking, Hong Kong chief executive, just talking about how, you know, the, the, the government will reinforce the city status as an offshore rim and B-hub. Uh, wealth management is a policy uh, priority for the bank. As you can see, some on watchers are just looking at the camera right now. That's live TV for because we're actually on a very big screen right behind me alongside John Lee talking as well. Yeah, we're big time. Um, Mark Tucker, uh, the chairman of HSBC, <laughs> speaking about a few minutes back ahead of John Lee welcoming the audience, talking about, for one, that Hong Kong does remain a solid financial center and that the Hong Kong dollar peg is rock solid. So we'll be having those conversations coming up. We're, we're waiting for John Lee uh, to finish up his speech, of course, because in the audience, audience in that room behind me is Noel Quinn of HSBC, who will be joining us in a couple of minutes. So in the meantime, while we, of course, continue to listen to John Lee, let me send it back to you in our Hong Kong studios. Vaughn. All right. We'll get to you soon. Of course, looking forward to your conversation with Noel Quinn there, the, the CEO of HSBC. We're also kind of down to the reopen of mainland markets. There's certainly a lot of anticipation, some anxious nerves, I'm guessing, from some of these uh, RMB traders out there with that fix coming out uh, any minute now, really, on what sort of direction and signals the central bank is going to send when it comes to the currency. Yeah, futures flat this morning. This is The China Show. Good morning. Just, just in that Remedy fix, you've been all been waiting for it. 709.47. So it is a much stronger fix, also stronger than what we saw on Wednesday. So that's why you're seeing that dip when it comes to dollar China here this morning. So we are seeing some strength come back to this currency just slightly here, but 724.71 as, of course, mainland markets return from that holiday. So there is that official pushback that we're getting after we did see that onshore rate go to that no go area. 
last week. We'll see if we ever get close to that as well. But certainly we, it's a ninth straight day that we have seen that fixing below that 710 level, which Stephen Chu from our BI told us, yes, that is sort of the line in the center, at least a signal to PBOC whether they will let this currency go or not. All right, another breaking news that we've been tracking this morning. Defaulted Chinese developer Shi Mao is facing a demand to liquidate from China Construction Bank. The winding up petition is related to a financial obligation of $202 million. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Loretta Chen joining us on the phone with this story. Loretta, I mean, walk us through what's the latest and, and was this a surprise in some ways? Yeah, so the latest um, that we heard uh, from this statement from Shimao this morning is that China Construction Bank Asia is uh, demanding to liquidate the company for that borrowing of uh, $200 million. Um, and that's essentially the latest trouble for, for the company. So Shimao, in the meantime, is trying to come up with an, a holistic offshore restructuring plan for its creditors, which was actually met with a lot of objections um, over the past few weeks. So it seems like, you know, on the one hand, the company is trying to come up with some kind of concrete plan um, after over two years of its default. And in the meantime, there are creditors who are just getting more and more impatient and they're trying to go through that winding up petition uh, route that we saw um, that actually led to the demise of China Evergrande Group. Yeah. How, how many winding up petitions have you seen? So, I mean, they, they're piling up, certainly. Are we likely to see more further surprises down the road then, Loretta? Yeah, so I think what's interesting in the Shimao case is that it's a state-owned bank um, that's filing up that winding up petition. Um, and we know that um, Shimao faces a lot of uh, pressure from its creditors. So it's not just this single bank. It could also be from bondholders. So what's next, I think, will be interesting to watch is will that winding up petition get more support from other uh, Shimao creditors, you know, other stakeholders that are also getting, um, you know, increasingly fa uh, favorable towards that option to just wind up the company. And um, also it's worth noting that Shimao has um, a lot of offshore assets. It has uh, several development projects in Hong Kong, a hotel in Hong Kong. These are all up for grabs for creditors. So, so it's an interesting case to watch. Loretta, thank you, Loretta Chen there from our China credit team. And that's why potentially you're seeing that Bloomberg Intelligence Developers Index basically cut in half uh, in terms of market cap here in the past year or so. Certainly those liquidity issues are still weighing on the sector quite heavily. So we're watching these developers very closely, of course. Uh, it's also a big central banks week, particularly when it comes to this region, right? So U.S. CPI certainly is going to be front and center on the macro picture. But you have the BSP kicking things off here today. You have uh, RBNZ. You have Bank of Thailand, you have the ECB on Thursday, Bank of Korea, you have the MAS as well. I think most, if not all, are expected to stay on hold this week, but certainly there's a lot of focus on what the Fed is going to do, right? Are, are these central banks even willing to preempt the Fed or are they still waiting for cues to follow? That's certainly going to be the key issue here this week. Former U.S. Treasury Secretary and Bloomberg TV contributor Larry Summers says that the latest jobs report does show that the neutral rate is much higher than the Fed's estimates of around 2.6 percent. He told us why the Fed needs to reconsider its expectations. This was a hot report. Jobs above 300,000, upwards revision, strong household survey, hours uh, up, payrolls up at nearly a 10% annualized uh, rate. This was a hot report that suggested that, if anything, the economy is re-accelerating. Uh, this is very different from what lots of people, most people, I think, were uh, expecting and fits the thesis that the neutral rate is much higher than people supposed and tight money is much less potent than uh, people supposed. So let's talk about the neutral rate. You've said before that the Fed should have at least some idea of the neutral rate to know whether it's restrictive or not. We heard from Chair Powell this week, speaking at Stanford, where he said, yes, we are restrictive on our policy, and yet he quite explicitly said he doesn't need to worry about where the neutral rate is for policy going forward. That is like saying, saying we don't need to know what the neutral rate is 
is like saying you should drive your car on feel without looking at the speedometer. It is just a mistake. You cannot know, and look, I don't know what uh, the chairman said in full context, and I want to be fair, but there's no way to judge what policy is without knowing what would be a neutral policy. My view is that the evidence is overwhelming, that the neutral rate is far higher than the 2.5%, 2.6% that the Fed talks about. That evidence comes from four places. First, we have high interest rates and we have an economy that is, if anything, growing faster than its long run uh, potential, creating jobs as fast or faster than natural growth in the labor force, even allowing for immigration. Second, we have an economy with financial conditions that are extremely loose, that are actually looser than they were before the Fed started the whole tightening process. If you look at credit spreads, you look at the stock market, suggesting that in the fullness of it all, financial conditions actually haven't been tightened in an appreciable way. Third, if you look at the market's estimate of the long-run neutral rate as formed by looking at longer-term uh, forward uh, interest rates, that neutral rate is comfortably above uh, 4%. Fourth, if you look at the fundamental determinants of the neutral rate, we have big surges in uh, budget deficits that, if anything, look to get worse uh, given the political process. We have big changes in resilience investment, in green investment, in new investment, in uh, data centers, along with deglobalization, which may limit capital inflows uh, into our country. So whether you look at the fundamentals, you look at market estimates, you look at financial conditions, or you look at the current strength of the economy, it seems to me the evidence is overwhelming that the neutral rate is far higher than the Fed supposes. Former U.S. Treasury Secretary Larry Summers there speaking with David Weston. We got plenty more ahead and talking more about that China agenda as well. Also tracking that renminbi now at 724.69. This is Bloomberg. All right, I think a, a less anxiousness, more maybe calm nerves here this morning. Take a look at how the dollar China trade is looking at here today. The PPOC saying that fake's pretty steady on the back of after we saw that yuan dropping near that policy ban. So certainly that's one to watch here as well. Property developers as well with Shi Mao getting that winding up petition. We're down some 5% in the pre-market. Noel Quinn from HSBC joins us next. This is Bloomberg. There's a bit of fog across these markets in greater China. Maybe it's just that hangover at post sevens that you're feeling here right now, of course, as you guys come back to uh, the, the, the Monday morning session here. So you're seeing the pre-market down about four tenths of one percent here. Futures are slightly in the red. Regionally speaking, though, we're actually seeing a decent day in the back of that blowout U.S. job support here as well. The Treasury market still seeing a bit of pressure here this morning after that Treasury curve. Basically, yields are basically back to the highs that we saw since November of last year. So certainly this correction in fixed income is still what we're closely watching out for. That remedy as well. So still some stabilization here right now for the currency after that that fix was set below 710 for the first start well, first well nine straight days or sessions I should say coming back from that mainland holiday uh, four days off. This is what we're seeing when it comes to onshore. So we're seeing slight declines in Shanghai here this morning. We're down about four tenths of one percent. Hang Seng seeing a little bit more downside. MSC China also seeing in the red. It seems like HS Tech is on offer. Small caps also. And we're watching very closely these commodity futures given the fact that they're playing a bit of catch up to what we've been seeing with the oil price with with a hundred 
bucks a barrel basically in sight, as some say. Dollar China is still around 724.70. We're still watching and waiting for that onshore rate to kick in a little bit in the next few seconds or minutes here. Iron ore and Dalian pretty much flat this morning. So we're waiting for things to digest a little bit here, but not a whole lot of conviction, uh, even when it comes to CGBs this morning as well. You take a look at what we're watching in terms of movers. It's the breaking news when it comes to Shimao. So China Construction Bank filing this winding up petition on the developer. They've kind of been doing this for several developers now from the state bank. So certainly this is one that we're watching very closely. That's why you're seeing Shimao shares down close to 8% here. Uh, Sunak, China, uh, Greentown, China Wonka, some of these are not doing as much, but this is going to take some time to really kick in. Uh, we're watching the, the PBOC giving close to $70 billion in loans to boost science and technology. So chip makers, hardware stocks very much in focus here today. Also watching some of this tourism data that came out for the Qingming holidays. Tourists spent nearly 13% more during those four days than back in 2019. So CTG duty free, for example, up about seven tenths of 1% here right now. Dave. Yep, there we go. So as we, oh, thank you by the way, Yvonne, for the, uh, just for the recap of the open day, certainly quite timely as we make our way into a fresh trading and business week. We're here, of course, at the first HSBC Global Investment Summit. It begins today. It's for three days, of course. You have a thousand, more than a thousand people gathering here. We'll talk more really of what's in store and what the plans are these next few days or so. Uh, in the meantime, though, let's uh, have a conversation with someone, I think, who works at the bank. Noel Quinn, uh, HSBC CEO, is here with us uh, on set to discuss this. Good morning and thank you for having us here, by the way. Thank you. So we were supposed to start this interview about 10, 15 minutes earlier, but I understand we had competition with John Lee, the Hong Kong chief executive, wanted some minutes of your time. Indulge us. What did you guys talk about? Well, it was a really good conversation with John, and he really reinforced his commitment to continuing to develop the economy of Hong Kong, very much focused on how we build new momentum into the economy. And that's what this conference is all about, the Global Investment Conference. It's really all about connecting the economies of the world. And we've got over 3,500 delegates here this week, over 1,100 financial institutions from around the world, over 40 countries represented. And we got over 250 corporates presenting to those financial institutions. In total, I think there's going to be around about 5,000 bilateral meetings taking place between institutions and corporates. And the whole purpose of this is to talk about the development of the world economy, particularly here in Asia and particularly Hong Kong. And that was the conversation that we had with John before the summit. Yeah, he did mention that you know developing the wealth management sector does remain a policy priority, which of course it's a very very big, big business for you guys as well. I just want to get a sense really of you know, there have been some polarizing comments around Hong Kong, and not to get into the politics, of course. For one, Stephen Roach, of course, of Yale, Morgan Stanley, ex Morgan, said Hong Kong is over. That's one extreme. I would imagine the bank has a different position. Uh -huh. Now, to say that nothing has changed with Hong Kong would be a disservice. How do you think things have changed? And how, what do you think people have to keep in mind as you do business here? Well, in this let, me, part of the let world? me just give you some facts. If I look at what, what we did in 2023, the performance of our wealth and personal banking business here in Hong Kong, we saw significant customer acquisition growth. We also saw around about a 50% growth in our insurance and wealth business in terms of the new business they were writing last year. So the facts are wealth management is continuing to develop and grow here in Hong Kong. The liquidity base here in Hong Kong today is higher than pre-COVID levels. So I still see Hong Kong as a vibrant financial center. Capital markets are subdued at the moment, but that's a function of still coming out of COVID, economies waiting to recover, what will inflation and interest rates do? But we're seeing some early signs of the debt capital market starting to pick up as well. So the facts, I think, support the fact that Hong Kong still is a vibrant financial market. Right. Now, the, I know you're set to report your first quarter earnings in a couple of weeks, so you can't yeah. get into the details as well. But we just wrapped up, of course, the calendar quarter. Yeah. If you could also indulge us, how do you think the quarter went for you guys, generally speaking? Well, 2023 went extremely well, over $30 billion of profit. Yeah. Record a record, profit. A record profit. And that's a culmination of the hard work of our colleagues over the past uh, four and a half years. And also the loyalty of our customers. They've been very supportive of HSBC as we went through COVID and transition. Um, our, return, uh, our returns were the best uh, for over 10 years. And our dividend at 61 cents was the best dividend for 15 years. So I was really pleased with the performance. We're never complacent. 
We're making sure that we're well positioned for the future and we're continuing to invest in the business. We're investing in wealth management here in Asia. We've done a number of acquisitions to do that. Uh, the most recent one that we announced was the acquisition of the Citibank wealth management business in mainland China. We bought an insurance business off AXA in Singapore and we bought an asset management business in India. And again, just to put it into context, every region performed well last year and every business line. In India, we made over one and a half billion dollars profit. Uh, if you put Bocom and our own shareholding of our own bank in China, we made over three and a half billion dollar profit. So, well distributed profit across the world and all parts of the bank doing extremely well. well suffice to say, is, is 30 billion the minimum target this year because it was such a good year last year? Do you think you'll surpass it this year? Well, nice try, David, but I can't <laughs> give profit forecasts at this stage. Well, okay, We're I'll, in the close period. But. Okay, well, <laughs> let, let me take some of the guidance you guys mentioned in the yeah. previous financial statement, which was you're looking to at least make 41 billion in net interest income this year so far. Yeah. That was in the assumption of rates two, three months back. Yeah. It doesn't seem rates are going to come down, though. Substantially, the, the, this year. And I'm wondering whether 41 is a conservative figure from well, you listen, guys. We will update our view as we go through each quarter, but we hold that guidance set up of at least 41 billion. Um, I think if you look at consensus at the moment, it's probably got us in at around 42 billion. But we will not update our guidance until we do Q1 results. Right. Uh, Q1 results are coming out. I think people are expecting a special dividend from the divestment, of course, in Canada as well. Yeah. Uh, do shareholders still need to vote on that? Is that a done deal? Is that money in the pockets of shareholders at this point in time? No, the board have to make a decision with the Q1 results on uh, that dividend. It's our intention uh, that when we look at Q1 results and we close on that quarter, it would be uh, our intention if the board feel comfortable to then pay that special dividend of 21 cents. And that 21 cents is very deliberate. That's a very important uh, catch-up on the dividend that we cancelled many, many, uh, a few years ago during COVID. And I want to actually reward the loyalty of our customers and shareholders. And remember, many of our shareholders are retail customers, are retail customers here in Hong Kong. Um, and therefore, we want to pay that special dividend. I remember you. that. I remember that meeting a yeah. few years back. Yeah. Speaking of divestments, we've done some reporting on your plans around your assets in Germany. I was wondering if you could comment on what your plans are for well, listen, those assets. We remain absolutely committed to being an international wholesale bank across all of Europe, including in Germany. So there's no change to that. Okay. Um, so those are not for sale. Those are not for sale. We have some business lines in Germany okay. that are non-essential to inter international wholesale banking. And we're considering options for those, and that's what the rumor and the speculation was. But, um, but that is not about our international wholesale banking proposition or a corporate banking proposition in Germany. Thank you for clarifying. Assets in Russia, I know the bank has also been looking at that. If you could give us an update on whether those are actually up for sale and when you want those. Well, we or have, have a price tag for them. We have regulatory approval to sell that business. We're going through the final stages of trying to close that transaction. Uh, but it is our intention uh, to sell the business. We have regulatory approval on it. And we're in the close. We're in the process of trying to close that transaction. Okay. Since we're here, I want to ask you about China. And you mentioned China already. I know you've done in the most recent transaction was the city's wealth management yeah. business. That's been fully folded into the business at this point in time. Uh, we haven't yet closed. We're closing shortly. So we've okay. agreed the sale. We're going through regulatory approval and that transaction will close. But let me bring you back to our business in China last year. HSBC China um, made over a billion dollars of profit and it grew its profit by 9% last year. So last year, some commentators would say it was a challenging year for China, but we still managed to grow our business. And we're very, we're, one of the jobs that we always do and have done for nearly 160 years is connecting the world. Our role as a bank, as an international and global bank, is to connect the economies of the world. Those economies are changing. The patterns of trade are changing. The patterns of investment are changing. But we firmly believe that it is not deglobalization, it is reglobalization, and the patterns of trade are changing, and we'll help our clients and we'll help the economies of the world connect in the new form. Right, and you know, people talk about de-risking, for example, between the two global economic superpowers. You see the data because you're a global trade bank. You yeah. see these flows and you bank these transactions. Yeah. Are you seeing any signs of decoupling, actually, between the two countries? No, but trade patterns are changing. I think one of the lessons of COVID was supply chain concentration caused resilience issues. 
it's not just geopolitics that are changing trade patterns. It's also domestic economies are changing. The trade route between the Middle East and Asia is much more vibrant today than it would have been 10 years ago. Saudi Arabia presents huge opportunities for Asia, for Asia corporates to trade with Saudi Arabia. So too the UAE, very dynamic economy growing strongly. More and more dialogue is happening between the Middle East and Asia than would have been happening 10 years ago. That's the nature of trade. It changes. And we're here to connect the new trading patterns going forward. It's certainly become a very dominant part of the conversation, these links between the Middle East. Final question for you, Noel. I know you're, uh, you're, you're busy today. Uh, you mentioned bolt-on acquisitions in yes. China, for example. So given your footprint right now, city business, what else are you looking to complement in China? A longer-term strategy. What do you want the bank's presence to look like? in mainland China? We really want to grow out. Uh, we've got a really strong wealth management business here in Hong Kong. I want an equally strong wealth management capability in mainland China, in Singapore, for Asia, mm. and in India. And what I really want is a platform of four strong pillars of wealth management. And in wealth management, I include insurance, asset management, right. private banking. And therefore, our acquisitions have been tended to be acquiring product or distribution capability in those markets mm. and that's what we've been doing and do we expect any transactions to be announced this year it sounds like you guys we are will only we great. will only announce when we're ready we do not pre-announce okay uh, when you look at china just just very very quickly your expectations in the economy the recovery has been slow do things get better materially this year well, listen, a 5.2% GDP growth last year is not a bad performance. That's a good performance in the first year after recovery. I, the China economy is going through transition, but I am confident they'll do their around 5% GDP growth this year. And I think we have to realize and focus very much on the medium and long-term opportunity in China. The urbanization that's taken place over the past two to three decades in China is a strong growth driver of GDP going forward for the next 10 to 20 years. And that's why we're still investing in China, because we see that long-term potential. Transition is taking place. Now is the time to invest, in my view, in China, to be part of that transition and the future growth. No, thank you for making the time. And it's of course, thank you for having us here as well at the Global no Investment Summit as well. No Quinn there, Yvonne, HSBC, CL. Lots of our conversations coming up here. In the meantime, we'll just take a very short break, at least here. I know you have some work to do there, Yvonne, so I'll send it back to you in the studios. <laughs> yeah, you take a break. Fred Hu's coming through pretty soon as well. Our thanks to David and bringing that fantastic conversation with Noel Quinn from HSBC. We're tracking the moves that we're seeing in the currency here this morning. This is what the onshore rate is doing. So we're seeing, you know, it's pretty slow going so far. Um, but you take a look at us and how we came back after that holiday. So April 3rd, we ended on this. We're seeing a slight weakening from that here as well. But, you know, it's at 722.95. There's still a bit of a wide gap between the onshore and offshore rate this morning. Uh, you know, ANZ coming up with an interesting note saying the PBOC fixing shows it has no plans to allow yuan depreciation. But the big test is going to be Wednesday with that U.S. inflation print as well. Should there be another upsized inflation surprise in the U.S., as Kungo says, causing the dollar to rally? Pressure on the renminbi could return. We've got plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. We are extending that sell-off when it comes to fixed income and treasuries here this morning after we did see yields pick up to the highest since November. We're still seeing the 10-year up some two basis points here this morning, 442.37. 450 is certainly the major next threshold to watch, and a lot of it is going to depend on that U.S. inflation print on Wednesday as well. Take a look at when it comes to mainland markets, sort of bucking the trend, coming back from that four-day holiday, and still do a lot of digesting, I guess, when it comes to not just earnings, but also uh, what's been going on with the, the, the yield differentials and the weaker rim and be the like here. CSI 300 uh, is down about six tenths of one percent. Hang Seng and HS Tech though still on offer here this morning. HS Tech is down about four tenths of one percent. We've been focusing a lot on the property developers here this morning obviously with the news of Shi Mao uh, with CCB uh, filing a winding up petition. We still have some several upcoming maturities across bond markets here in China. The credit markets I think Wonka uh, is certainly one season as well. So maybe we could be in store for for some other surprises here as we count down the next few weeks 
or so. You take a look at what uh, the rest is going out. And of course, we're tracking still very much what's been going on at the HSBC Global Investment Summit. And David is sitting with our next guest, Dave. Uh, Fred, good morning, and thank you for joining us here, here, here in set. Um, in case some of our viewers might have just overheard our little chatter right now, I was just asking you how things are in mainland China, because you spend a lot of time in many places in China as well. Give us a sense of where you think this recovery is, based on what you're seeing. You know, clearly I have seen an uh, increasing number of signs the economy is turning the corner. Economic recovery is picking up. You know, everywhere I see, I see green shoots uh, uh, picking up in economic activity, you know, whether it's in uh, industrial production, uh, in consumer, uh, in the service sector. So, yeah, definitely, you know, uh, the economy is uh, recovering uh, slowly but surely. Okay. Does it need any more additional support? What do you make of the current basket of economic support measures right now? I think it would be uh, tremendous if the government continues to provide uh, robust support to ensure the recovery will be sustained. Right. Uh, you know, on the monetary and liquidity front, for example, you know, the economy still face, uh, you know, some downward, uh, you know, pressure on price, i.e. deflation pressures. Mm. So I think the government would be smart to take steps to counter uh, like the deflation pressure. Right. And, you know, some of the challenges to the economy are partly why the big global investors have so far just been watching China and being big patient on the sidelines waiting to deploy capital. What are you seeing from your perspective, mostly in the private markets, say from global LPs as they look at China? Are they looking to increase their exposure? Are they waiting for more support measures from the government? Just what's your sense of that? I think global investors are up to watching China very, very closely. You know, uh, some still have some concerns uh, regarding the pace of economic Economic recovery. Others may uh, are concerned about uh, policy regulatory uh, uncertainties. Uh, but uh, again, as we speak, you know, there's been improvement on both fronts. For example, you know, economic recovery is taking place. But more importantly, we have seen more uh, clarity, uh, consistency, right. and more assurance in terms of policy messaging. Um, you know, since last year. One of the comments, and I forgot who it was from several years ago that stuck with me, and I, I essentially we asked about what are the attitudes towards China, and the comment effectively was the closer you are to China, the closer you do business with China, the less worried people are. The further out you get, the bigger the misunderstanding is, for example. What's your sense right now of appetite for Chinese assets from global LDs, particularly in the U.S., for example? Right. I think uh, you know, global investors' appetite towards uh, investing in China remains uh, a little small, given the sheer size of the Chinese economy okay. and the size of the markets. Uh, but you know, again, I said because of the uh, people uh, see uncertainty, uh, you know, uh, comes down and uh, incremental evidence of economic uh, uh, recovery, I think people start to warm up towards uh, deploying more capital uh, towards China. So what are you busy with? Well, we've been very busy. First and foremost, is portfolio management. You yeah. know, all the companies we have invested, you know, 100 of them. Yeah. Uh, we want to make sure that they are doing well. Uh, number one, number two, we continue to look for new opportunities, especially in the consumer sector, you know, service sector, you know, healthcare, for example. And very importantly, we've been very active in. Uh, the energy transition, you know, the green economy, uh, renewable energy, you know, EV battery, uh, and the energy infrastructure, you know, for the new, uh, you know, uh, uh, new energy. So that, that's really China in this regard is undisputed the global leader, and did the so many exciting opportunities. Right. Leader, in fact, the other extreme has showed up as far as China's being global leadership in that space. Overcapacity issues in parts of the EV markets. 
what are you seeing as far as valuations? And is it a concern to you? Yeah, that, I think it's an exaggeration. Okay. You know, the share of EV in total uh, car ownership around the world, you know, and in China, is still too low, right? You know, we are facing a brewing climate crisis. We need to make a fast transition to uh, mission, uh, mission free uh, mobility. So, if you take the, you know, pendant demand for EV, you know, I would say the capacity, whether it's in China or in the US, like Tesla, and the Europeans are also investing, I think we're still, you know, uh, you know, uh, way behind the potential demand in order to make the energy transition. Right. Uh, I want to ask you about valuations. Currently, where do you see valuations going in your part of the well, financial market spectrum? Uh, the public market valuations is just the dirty cheap. Okay. You know, China well, has been so, <laughs> so beaten down, yeah. and uh, you know, every look at it is just cheap. Uh, private market is also, you know, with this lack, I think the valuation uh, is also has been adjusted uh, to a more realistic level uh, in line with the public market. What about your view on exits this year? So, uh, you know, it has been a tough uh, exit environment, okay. not here in uh, Asia, but also globally. Uh, but, um, you know, again, signs are that things are, uh, pop, you know, taking, improving. Hmm. Uh, IPOs are happening here in Hong Kong, in Shanghai, in Shenzhen, and I think in New York as, as well. Fred, I know you have a panel, of course, here, so we'll let you go. You're very busy. Thank you for making time for us there. Fred Hu there, group founder, chairman, and CEO, Yvonne Primavera Capital. Back to you. Great stuff, Dave. Sorry we peeked into your conversation a little bit early there, but we didn't hear too much. Don't worry. All right, take a look when it comes to these markets. We're watching one mover in particular, Evergrande NEV. So they've announced that this NWTN deal will not proceed. That's why you're seeing the stock plummeting some 15% here. They're basically saying proposed transactions and loan conversion will not move forward here. We're also watching when it comes to crude markets. Obviously, as they talk about breaking above 90 bucks, well, where are we right now? We're close to that. We're about 50 cents away from getting to 90 as well. We're taking a little bit of breather here today, though, given just some of the Middle East tensions uh, with talks of, of Israel to remove some Gaza troops and the like. And we're watching these benchmarks in China, of course, coming back from that Qingming hospital holiday, I should say. But take a look at what we're seeing here. Still some downside when it comes to onshore as well as the Hang Seng here this morning with the HS Tech seems to be leading that charge. But commodities is catching a slight bid in China this morning. Welcome back to the China Show. Here's a look at the CSI 300, just half hour into the session and reopening after that four-day holiday. And you are seeing just slight downside here today. We're off some of the lows already of the session. We're down about just close to four-tenths of 1%. The renminbi certainly has been in focus here. So we're seeing a little of, I guess you could say, relief or just stabilization uh, with dollar China here this morning with the PBOC setting that fixing pretty consistently below 710. So again, you know, signs of maybe keeping things the same way and no way are they allowed it to depreciate according to ANZ, but the key focus is going to be this U.S. inflation print on Wednesday. If we see another blowout number like we did with that U.S. job support and dollar takes a rip higher, more pressure for the currency could return as some look at that. So we're looking at that. Also, we're at the HSBC Global Investment Summit. Our very own David Inglis has been on the ground there speaking with the CEO, Fred Hu from Primavera just now, and still talking pretty optimistically about the Chinese economy there, Dave. Yeah, that, oh, this is Fred Hu, of course, and some of the commentary coming through from him a few minutes back that the economy is, is, is the recovery is taking place. It's perhaps in the slower side of the spectrum. Uh, he does expect and perhaps want to see more support coming out of government as far as economic policies are concerned. All that being said, they're still quite busy as far as transactions go. They're looking at consumers, EVs, and nothing much has changed as far as business as usual, despite the slow recovery taking place. Now, more here to the conversation in Hong Kong, and you mentioned we were just talking with 
Noel Quinn out of HSBC earlier following that speech coming out of Hong Kong Chief Executive John Lee talking about how Hong Kong uh, things do remain fairly robust. The policy priorities and wealth, which is echoed also from HSBC. Uh, in fact, we are just coming off a quite a vibrant, quite literal weekend as far as the Hong Kong Sevens goes, and of course HSBC part and parcel to that event. So we're coming into this morning with people maybe nursing perhaps a healthy hangover, uh, given the, all the fun that took place over the weekend. It's quite vibrant, though. It's taking place behind me. In any case, let me play a bit for you from our conversation earlier earlier with Noel Quinn of HSBC. In 2023, the performance of our wealth and personal banking business here in Hong Kong, we saw significant customer acquisition growth. We also saw around about a 50% growth in our insurance and wealth business in terms of the new business they were writing last year. So the facts are wealth management is continuing to develop and grow here in Hong Kong. The liquidity base here in Hong Kong today is higher than pre-COVID levels. So I still see Hong Kong as a vibrant financial center. All right, we'll have more with that conversation with Noel Quinn coming up in this hour as well. In terms of markets and what we're seeing on this Monday morning, it looks like it's mostly risk on. You take a look at how Asia is doing here. So, of course, that red hot U.S. jobs report on Friday sent equities higher, bonds selling off, and we're seeing that here in the Asia session. In fact, those treasuries are continuing to sell off here with the U.S. 10 year yield up some two basis points at 442 right now. The entire treasury curve is now back to those 2024 highs, in fact, back to levels that we saw back in November. But but nevertheless, you're still seeing yield differentials really helping the yen weaken. And then, of course, you're helping the Nikkei 225 see another rally of more than one and a half percent here this morning. Uh, we also are looking ahead to a lot of central bank action here in this part of the world. BSP kicking things off on Monday, RBNZ, Bank of Thailand, Bank of Korea, MAS. I forgot about ECB as well, but they're definitely be focusing on what this Fed repricing is going to do about their policy decisions moving forward. You take a look at what we're seeing right now. 450 certainly is the next level to watch when it comes to that U.S. 10-year yield. Does that spur more buying back in this, into this bond market? That's still a key question many are answering here this morning. But yes, as we heard from Larry Summers, that neutral rate should be higher. But U.S. Treasuries basically had the second worst week since October last week here as well. It's because of this. We talked about the jobs report. Seeing the most jobs added since last May. So certainly that was unexpected that we continue to see resilient data. You got to wonder what that US CPI print is going to bring on Wednesday. Are we likely to see more volatility in these bond markets as well? We also heard from the Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin and Michelle Bowman, the Fed governor, last week saying rate cuts can wait. When the economy is as strong as it is, mm -hmm. it's hard to feel urgency on taking yeah. rates down. Are you going to mm -hmm. see a dramatic weakening in the economy, as I've suggested the demand pessimists might see? Or are you going to see strength 353,000 jobs a month like we apparently saw last month? Should the incoming data continue to indicate that inflation is moving substantially toward our 2% goal, it will eventually become appropriate to gradually lower the federal funds rate to prevent monetary policy from becoming overly restrictive. However, in my view, we are still not yet at the point where it's appropriate to lower the policy rate. And I continue to see a number of upside risks to inflation. For more, let's bring in Garfield Reynolds, who leads our Markets Live Asia coverage. Uh, I want to bring in Garfield here. Just talk a bit more about, I mean, we, we thought 4.3 4, you know, was, was a, a pretty much a high bar, but we're, we're getting closer to 450 for that U.S. 10-year yield. What are we looking at ahead of this U.S. inflation print later on this week, Garfield? Are we likely to see stabilization or, or for more of this sell-off? Well, I think the sell-off could go further, even if inflation comes in in line. If it comes in slower than expected, then you, then you'd see consolidation and, and a, a tick down in yields. But there's just been so much strong data, so much to push back against the idea that uh, you know rate cuts are coming anytime soon, and it's becoming more and more difficult to stick to the idea that the Fed is going to cut three times. We've now got about a 95% chance that they do cut the first time in July. That means if that does happen, if they were to cut in July, that would mean they only have four meetings 
you know, before the end of the year, including that one, to get three cuts. So that's a very, you know, Jekyll and Hyde, uh, you know, e economic outlook. If you say, well, hold, 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 and then cut, hold, cut, cut, that's, that's a rapid move already. So with that, there's a high bar for your bonds to rally seriously from here and a bias for them to you know, keep on moving up. I do think 4.5% is the next target. I also think there's a very strong chance that if we get to 4.5%, unless things really go nuts, and I don't know that they will, then that's when a lot of buyers will come in. They'll say 4.5% is you know, nice, we'll take that. You know, we think that's the sort of level of income that we can hang on to for a while with the expectation that eventually we are going to get those Fed rate cuts, even if it's only two this year and then four next year instead of three this year and three next year. And that's going to you know, give us the sort of gains from holding 10-year bonds that we like, along with having a nice cushion of 4.5%. So I think in the, in the short to medium term, 4.5%, a test of that is very likely. Uh, I think it's also likely we actually get there. I have doubts we can go too much further, especially because we don't get any more Jerome Powell now until the, the May Fed meeting. Uh, so we'll just get you know, some of the contributors who are a bit hawkish. But the Fed's stance of three rate cuts this year is kind of going to still be hanging over the bond market and saying, more than 4.5 is a big stretch. Where are we likely going to see this volatility? I mean, are, you mentioned about people might start buying at 450 at the 10 year. Is a short in the curve still going to be where we see most of that price action? And, and these bond steepeners everyone was trying to buy late last year, is that still a trade worth having? Well, I think it's a very difficult trade to stick with at the moment because uh, you, you're kind of, uh, you're, you're betting that two-year bonds are going to outperform 10-year bonds. When the data is this strong, that, that's not an easy bet you know, to, to, to make. And to be honest, you, you know, rather than buying into the two-year bonds at 4.75% or so, so with everything as uncertain as it is, both as far as the economic outlook and as far as the geopolitical output, there's a reason why every week we get a fresh record high in the amount of uh, you know, cash held in money market accounts, which you know, that gets you well above 5% and you don't face the same sort of risks. Right now, the outlook is making it hard to see strong gains for any part of the curve. So betting on a particular variation within the curve also becomes a very tough play. Garfield Reynolds, thank you, our chief rates correspondent for Asia and, of course, who leads our MLive team as well. We're keeping a close eye on the renminbi, of course, with those rate differentials. And we did see uh, some more policy stability when it comes to that fix here this morning. Take a look at how the onshore renminbi is going after being shut for four days. And I, things are slowed down and calmed down just a bit here right now. But we talk about that gap still between the offshore and onshore market. Uh, ANZ saying, you know, maybe this means the PBOC will not allow this currency to depreciate just given this consistent fix sub 710 once again let's get to our david finnerty he's our fx or race strategist joining us here this morning yeah what, what what was the message you think from the pboc this morning dave well, certainly the message is, as you indicated, that the PBOC is in no hurry to let you unfix. I mean, I think the market's heavily focused on 7.10 as sort of a line in the sand, and PBC went nowhere near that. In fact, it was slightly stronger than Friday's fix. So suddenly they said, OK, yes, it was a strong payrolls, but that's not going to, as far as they're concerned, they're not yet wanting that to translate into a, a much weaker yuan. And of course, while that continues, we have to wait and see, because as Garfield's indicated, we US CPI this week. And let's not forget we have US PPI, which will feed into the PCE, which is the Fed's preferred measure of inflation. That also comes out at the end of the week. So if those data comes out, if, and they said that is an if, if the data comes out strong on those fronts, then obviously that pushes yields higher and puts even more pressure on yuan. And particularly because other currencies will more than likely weaken against um, the dollar, therefore if the yuan stays strong, it by default also becomes stronger against these other currencies 
against the basket of currencies. And given the state of the Chinese economy, it comes a bit debatable how strong do you want the yuan to be generally against a basket of currencies. So I think it's going to be interesting this week, whereas PBC, uh, PBOC at the moment has drawn a line in the sand. Whether it continues to do that, um, we'll wait and see. But I wouldn't be surprised if it starts gradually trying to ease, let the yuan weaken if U.S. shields continue to push higher. It, you know, it's not just a RMB, right? We talk about, you know, if you talk about yen, you talk about all these other Asia FX in, in the EM world, we're basically at or near the, the lows of 2024 already. I mean, what's on your radar? What are you be watching out for the most this week in terms of currencies? Well, I think obviously the yen has always been a, a market favorite, shall we say, in this 152 area has been very interesting. Now, the differences this time around compared to, say, even just a week ago, is there was a lots of options and this, they have these contracts called reverse knockout barriers that had a barrier at 152. And the market was very cognizant of these. Now, a lot of these have expired last week. There's more expiring today and through this week. And after that, they sort of dwindle quite rapidly. So what happens is that from an option perspective, you're not as concerned about the 152. You're not trying to defend it as much. So therefore, if US yields do come in, or Oh, sorry, if US CPI comes in higher, pushing US yields higher with it, I think be, you'll find less resistance at that 152 level. Then, of course, the question is, when does the MOF intervene? If it goes 152 towards the 153, mm -hmm. they continually had this rhetoric saying, look, well, what's excessive moves? What they define as excessive and what the market defines as excessive can obviously be very different things. But certainly intervention pressures would grow on the MOF to intervene if it goes, dollar yen goes above 152. All right, David. Thank you, David Fiddity there, our Bloomberg FX and race strategist. Still ahead on the China show, we're going to talk crypto with Hashkey Group as they launch a new global exchange taking on the likes of Binance and OKX. That is ahead. This is Bloomberg. Yeah, uh, you know, we're also talking crypto with 91. I'm kidding. We're not talking crypto with 91. Hendrik the Toy joins us right now. He just made a face right now on the back of that banner. We're talking all things public and private markets, investment strategy, and with the firm's plans, of course, uh, for the rest of this year. So stay tuned for good conversations coming up here. You're watching The China Show. Welcome back. We're, well, you're joining us, um, and we're live here at the Conrad Hotel for the HSBC Nagra Global Investment Summit. Joining us here on set to talk us through investment strategies is the founder and CEO at 91, Hendrik Detoy. It's very nice to see you. Um, you were just inside listening to the speech. Mark Tucker, HSBC chair, John Lee, Hong Kong chief executive. What's your, your, your thoughts on the opening remarks? And do you think Hong Kong is back? Did it ever go away? I think Hong Kong is coming back. John Lee made very market friendly and very clear uh, observations about where Hong Kong is going, what it's authorized to do as part of, you know, the one country, two systems uh, 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 arrangement. But also, Mark Tucker said, and he made a very powerful point, that the world is not deglobalizing, and actually, HSBC is continuing with its mission of connecting the world. And Niall Ferguson followed up with a brilliant speech all about the complexity of the global economy, but also pointing out the increased geopolitical risk. So we live in a multipolar, very interesting world with diversified investment opportunities. Right, and as someone who looks at these different opportunities and the, the habits and flows, and you determine, of course, what new strategies kind of make sense. We were talking during the break, you know, some in your industry are starting ex-China EM strategies, for example. Do you think that makes commercial sense, for example? Does it make investment sense as well? I am here, and 91 has people in the region, uh, substantial office here, because we believe uh, the, best is to, the best arrangement is a more integrated global economy where one searches for opportunities across the world which, provides diversific which provide diversification benefits. However, we live in a world with increased political tension, and uh, Niall Ferguson quoted Henry Kissinger in his last year in, on Earth, who said, 
we are not at the foothills, but we are in the mountain passes of Cold War II. And therefore, one has to provide investors with their preferences. And I think an emerging market ex-China is preferable for some investors. We think it is much more sensible investing in a truly diversified emerging market portfolio, which includes China, because the Chinese companies are highly integrated, particularly in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Right. Let's now talk investment strategy specifically. We're done with the first quarter. We thought rate cuts were coming from the Fed. It doesn't look like that's going to happen soon. What strategies have worked so well, far? The one thing that has worked, and by the way, in 2022, I think 100% of economists in your survey forecast substantial interest rate cuts in the following year. Right. Okay. And the one thing that's worked is to realize, and it's a comment Mark Carney made in 2022, is that Jerome Powell doesn't want to be Arthur Burns. Jerome Powell doesn't want to be the central banker to have cut too early and reignited inflation. And I think the central scenario at 91 uh, is one where we are cautious on the interest rate picture, where we see the U.S. still attracting a lot of capital because of higher rates, and therefore investing in robust businesses, robust countries, and not going for uh, a, a strategy of hope of early interest rate cuts. But we are two years nearer to interest rate cuts from that 2022 well, mistaken forecast. Well, the longer we wait, the closer we get. Of course, of course. And, and, inf and uh, but inflation is a hard, and if you read about inflation, to get inflation out of a system is much harder than we all think. Right. And we now live in a world where everything can be on demand. We order things quickly, the, you know, whatever we want to do happens quickly. And fighting inflation is a slower battle, and we need to pre be prepared for that in our portfolios. Do you think global portfolios are too concentrated on U.S. exceptionalism, U.S. exposure? I think, you know, whereas indexation is a useful tool in investment, uh, it still is a backward-looking way of investing. And I think we're reaching a stage where capital, whether driven by machines or indices, has concentrated too much in certain parts of the world based on past momentum. And that's when accidents happen. And you need to sensible investors diversify ahead of that, sacrifice some returns, but ultimately retain their capital. And I think we were in one of those phases where unfashionable asset classes should be uh, uh, attracting investor, sensible investor attention for that reason. Like, like what? I mean, firstly, emerging markets, Europe. I mean, okay, Japan has been deeply unfashionable for a very long time, but Japanese equities have started to show the way. Uh, the UK is, you know, where we have a large presence, is dirt, dirt cheap. I think at the end of the day, risky emerging markets are very dependent on the dollar cycle, but robust businesses in emerging markets and robust uh, debt instruments are actually at a point where they're looking very, very attractive. So I, I would be arguing more diversification, but of course not ignoring the, the profound impact of tech. But don't think tech is not subject to massive, massive pressures. Just think what quantum computing will do to the major market cap businesses in the world today. They are not quantum computing friendly. They are all talking AI. Right. It's, it's hard to diversify, though, when you look at correlations that have been just so close to each other. And when do, when do you think that ends? Do you think that ever ends? Are we in a new, uh, does the Fed rate cut start that? No, maybe, maybe it's hope, but I think <laughs> we are very close. Yeah. And, and as an investment professional, you want normal conditions. You want normal risk premium right. because that's rational. I think once the U.S. interest rate cycle, once we get to the peak, we will have a very normal distribution of risk as opposed to this highly correlated, abnormal, artificial world of massive central bank intervention that we've had, starting in the financial crisis, but accelerated by the post-COVID reaction and, and the subsequent addiction to cheap money. So I can say straight, the world of cheap money is over. 
But once cost of capital is there again, at a re in a real sense, we move to a much more rational investment world. That's driven a lot of money into private markets because that yield is there. You know, private credit, 10 to 15 percent, what have yes. you. Is that a structural shift? And when does that even come back? I think the shift to private markets is structural. What stimulated it and what led to its overgrowth was cheap money. Mm. With expensive money, lots of ex accidents will be exposed, passing the parcel will stop, and public markets will be needed to exit private assets. Mm. So at 91, we are champions of both. But we think public markets should think about, and that's where John Lee's comments were so refreshing, about regulating itself appropriately to be competitive as well, because we went into a phase of over-regulation, over-governance in public markets, which made them less attractive. And I think we just have to re rethink how our capital markets, public and private, work together as an ecosystem, but it isn't one or the other. Okay. Final question, the most hard-hitting one. You arrived on Saturday. How do you think South Africa did at the sevens? Uh, Happy? No, no. Coming sixth is not good enough, particularly given that we're the current world champions in the 15s game. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe next time. Nice to see you, of course. Thank you very much. Uh, Hendrik Detoy, their founder and CEO at 91. Plenty more ahead here. You're watching The China Show. All right, we're taking a look at when it comes to private developers here this morning, and Shermao is certainly the one in focus here. We're dropping some 11% on that stock here on the back of CCB, filing that winding up petition in Hong Kong. Uh, it's dropping, it's at least dragging some of these private developers across the board, with the exception of Wanka here this morning. Uh, Evergrande NEV, that's also one. They talk about this deal uh, when it comes to NWTM, I believe that's the right acronym there, that they will no longer proceed uh, with that deal, the stock down. 10% or so. Bever stocks are also drunk on something. Uh, it looks like the Budweiser 8-pack first quarter sales outlook was a bit weak, talking about uh, some weaker mainstream volumes and beer volumes alike here. And you're watching very closely what goes on through some of these other beer stocks as well. Kuei Chan Maltai also leading that drag down the onshore market here this morning. This is Bloomberg. Eleven twenty nine AM in Tokyo. We're heading to that lunch break here with a rally that continues to go here on this Monday morning. We're up one point three percent for the Nikkei two two five. The yen is still on the slightly weaker side, close to that one fifty two level. So certainly that's lifting the equity market here this morning. GGB yields not doing a whole lot as well. But certainly that speculation around the BOJ and that Ueda interview last week with Asahi certainly did maybe lift a little more expectations that maybe there is one more rate hike this year or even they're going to use the currency as some way in factoring into their considerations when it comes to monetary policy. To the rest of Asia and how the markets dashboard is looking like here today, it looks like you know Japan is really leading the charge, but we are seeing a decent broad-based rally here with the exception of what we're seeing in greater China. U.S. futures are flat after we saw a pretty decent rally after that U.S. jobs report on Friday. The dollar it basically has been unchanged here as well, but it's really the, the, stock, the, the stocks have been gaining, but bonds have been selling off quite dramatically on the back of that blowout number that we got on Friday. So certainly that's going to be a key focus for many central banks this week. BSP, that certainly is one to watch as well. Uh, obviously, you know, it seems like all these central banks are set to hold this week, but certainly are they going to push back on these bets about rate cuts that are coming? That certainly is one that you're expected to hear from when it comes to RB and Z as well. The Bank of Thailand, certainly there's a lot going on there, uh, given just how weak these currencies are. The Thai bot is down some seven percent year to date and certainly when it comes to singapore mas that could be quite interesting as well inflation is still elevated due to that hike in gst so certainly one to watch there ecb obviously on thursday for some of the g10 and the macro picture as well um, but really brings us back to the discussion of this sort of higher for longer scenario how it's impacting the likes of banks like hsbc and certainly you had a very wide-ranging conversation dave i'll bring you back in with the ceo <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's a very good starting point because one of the things, Yvonne, we discussed uh, a couple of minutes back, and we'll play the interview in just a moment here, you know, where do they think that, you know, their business that's contingent 
and a function of interest rates go this year. The guidance they came out with at the start of the year, so after Q4 they reported, was for at least 41 billion uh, in terms of net interest income. That's a massive number, right? So they're coming off uh, a 2023 where despite, of course, and one of the headlines coming through was the 3 billion impairment because of their exposure to BOCOM. Despite that, they clocked in 30 billion in profit. And looking at this year, 41 billion at least as far as net interest income is concerned. So I asked them, you know, what if, what if central banks don't even end up cutting rates, for example, or if that gets pushed back, or if the rate cuts are even shallower than expected, is that 41 billion figure slightly too conservative? Suffice to say, and long story short, is higher for longer rate environment has been really good for the banking sector, at least that part of the business. Capital markets are coming back, maybe debt capital market, he said, to, to some extent. All that being said, you know what, enough of me, let's hear from Noel Quinn, HSBC CEO. In 2023, the performance of our wealth and personal banking business mm. here in Hong Kong, we saw significant customer acquisition growth. Right. We also saw around about a 50% growth in our insurance and wealth business mm. in terms of the new business they were writing last year. So the facts are wealth management is continuing to develop and grow here in Hong Kong. Mm. The liquidity base here in Hong Kong today is higher than pre-COVID levels. Mm. So I still see Hong Kong as a vibrant financial center. Capital markets are subdued at the moment, but that's a function of mm. still coming out of COVID, mm. the economy is waiting to recover. What will inflation and interest rates do? Right. But we're seeing some early signs of the debt capital markets starting to pick up as well. Mm. So the facts, I think, support the fact that Hong Kong still is a vibrant financial market. Right. Now, the, I know you're set to report your first quarter earnings in a couple of weeks, so you can't yeah. get into the details as well. But we just wrapped up, of course, the calendar quarter. Yeah. If you could also indulge us, how do you think the quarter went for you guys, generally speaking? Well, 2023 went extremely well. Over $30 billion of profit. Record A record, a record profit. Mm. And that's a culmination of the hard work of our colleagues over the past uh, four and a half years. Mm. And also the loyalty of our customers. They've been very supportive of HSBC mm. as we went through COVID and transition. Um, our, return, uh, our returns were the best uh, for over 10 years. And our dividend at 61 cents mm. was the best dividend for 15 years. So I was really pleased with the performance. We're never complacent. We're making sure that we're well positioned for the future mm. and we're continuing to invest in the business. We're investing in wealth management here in Asia. We've done a number of acquisitions to do that. Right. Uh, the most recent one that we announced was the acquisition of the Citibank wealth management business in mm. mainland China. We bought an insurance business off AXA in Singapore right. and we bought an asset management business in India. And again, just to put it into context, every region performed well last year and every business line. In India, we made over one and a half billion dollars profit. Uh, if you put Bocom and our own shareholding of our own bank in China, we made over three and a half billion dollar profit. Right. So, well distributed profit across the world and all parts of the bank doing extremely well. Yeah, there we go. My conversation earlier on with the HSBC CEO, the boss, Noel Quinn, here at the Global Investment Summit, the first one, of course, taking place here in the city. We're at the Conrad Hotel, by the way, just in case you're wondering where I am. Just uh, not too far, of course, from our studios in central Hong Kong, where Yvonne is, of course. Yvonne. Yeah. Um, it, it seems like it's bustling there right now, getting pretty loud where you are. So certainly uh, a lot of talk about Hong Kong still being that vibrant financial hub uh, and also HSBC. Uh, that was some of the lines coming through from Noel Quinn as well. Some of the stories that we're tracking for you following in China as well. A new report showing investment into Australia by Chinese companies tumbled in 2023 to the second lowest level in 18 years. Analysis by KPMG and the U University of Sydney estimate direct investments last year slid to $892 million. That's a 37 percent decline from 2022. In contrast, China's global outbound investment jumped last year, driven by countries participating in its belt and road initiative. Chinese Minister of Commerce Wang Wentao has held a roundtable meeting with Chinese EV makers in Paris. More than 10 companies, including Geely, SAIC, BYD, and CATL, attended, along with the EU Chamber of Commerce in China. Now, they discussed the business situation in Europe and the EU's anti subsidy investigation into Chinese EVs. President Biden is said to be planning to warm China 
this week about its increasingly aggressive activity in the South China Sea. The Financial Times quotes senior U.S. officials saying Biden will express serious concern about the situation around the second Thomas Shoal. Now that's the area where Chinese and Philippine ships have clashed in recent months. And the U.S. is said to be warning allies that China has stepped up support for Russia in its war against Ukraine. Sources say Beijing has provided satellite imagery for military purposes, as well as microelectronics and machine tools for tanks. The White House says President Biden raised China's support for Russia's military during his call last week with President Xi. We got plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. All right, we're checking Bitcoin. Not a whole lot of movement here this morning. We're still well below that 70,000 level after we uh, really reached north of that in the last couple of weeks or so. So we're coming off some of the highs of the year. Ethereum, though, seems to be catching a bit here this morning as well. Bell, let's bring in Annabelle Drewlers. She's back and looking at some of the warning signs that we're seeing across crypto markets yeah, now. Yeah, well, actually, though. interesting, Avon, you mentioned what's happening in Bitcoin versus Ether because this chart here puts it in perspective. You've got the price of Bitcoin trading against that second largest token. It's now the highest level that we've seen since 2021. Now, of course, when it comes to crypto markets, a lot of that attention is on the so-called FOMO trade, fear of missing out. But this could be an indication that perhaps we're really just heading into a, a thing of fear instead of investors are sort of retreating away from some of the smaller tokens and putting their money into Bitcoin, the largest token instead. Uh, it is certainly a very interest, interesting dynamic when you take a look at how the biggest cryptocurrency exchanges are faring in the world. If you bring up this chart, taking a look at some of the biggest five or six, the trading volumes that they're seeing on a daily basis here, and really is uh, still Binance very much in dominant position, even though it did a raise uh, down to around 30% of global exchange volumes uh, following all those regulatory issues in the US, but still very much the dominant player. Only a handful, again, on an international level can get those sorts of trading volumes north of the $1 billion mark in a 24-hour period of on. Yep, and we got to talk about a new entrant into the space, hash key. Uh, here in Hong Kong that is now launching their global crypto exchange. And joining us now is Ben Albay, a managing director at Hashkey Global. Joining us here in Hong Kong, Ben, it's great to have you here. Great, thanks. Um, it seems like this is a market that clearly gears towards some of the top players. Mm. Why do you think we need another crypto to crypto exchange? Now, this is, uh, this is an excellent question, right? Uh, you know, Hashkey Group has been around since, since 2018. Uh, we spent a lot of time uh, on day one, first acquiring a license in Hong Kong to operate uh, an exchange. And what we saw globally after, you know, the, in the aftermath of FTX, uh, end of 2022, is we definitely saw a gap in the market in terms of, uh, you know, a globally, uh, you know, a, a globally operated exchange that's able to operate under investor protection regime. Um, so that's why, you know, starting back uh, early 2023, we started to look really seriously at uh, what types of uh, investor protection regimes and licensing frameworks uh, globally could be, you know, the right the right jurisdiction for us. Um, and we saw in uh, in February of last year. We saw Coinbase uh, acquire uh, a license to operate a global exchange out of, out of Bermuda. Um, and we looked at all the different options, and we found that to be a very, very uh, suitable uh, and, and good uh, regulatory regime for us to, to expand from. But why do you think, though, that the, the, the international market can support another new entrant coming into it? Because even when you take a look at Binance, for instance, and they did a raise, as I said, down to around 30 percent of the total share of international volumes, down from 60, but they're still edging back up to around that 40 percent mark now, I think. Uh, why do you think there is room for another big entrant coming into the market? Well, I think, you know, I think if you look at this cycle versus last cycle, we're just having this conversation uh, with, with a few friends recently. The last cycle, the bear cycle, you had a lot of uh, the last bull and bear cycle. You had a lot of established players come into the market. You had Binance increase its market share. Uh, and then you also had large exchanges like FTX uh, essentially fail. Mm -hmm. And as we look, you know, as we look into the future in 2024, 2025, I think one of the most exciting things that we're looking for is users now compared to 2022 and 2021, users right now really understand, better understand what counterparty risk looks like for exchanges. So we think that, you know, user perspectives and customer perspectives around 
what does a you know suitable and, and prudently regulated exchange look like? We think that's changed, uh, and that trigger uh, makes us a lot more confident that if there's an exchange that's launched to market that's regulated under investor protection regime, uh, that that is going to be better able to you know gain the the confidence uh, of uh, of users in this space. So there's a lot of different things we're offering. This is an exchange that'll be offering spot trading, uh, perpetual futures trading, uh, also launchpad uh, launchpad type of products. So you know all these different products combined, you know. It, if, as long as you're launching new types of products to market, new tokens, that's a good way to to incentivize users to sign up for a new platform. Your trading volumes, though, I think it's around 35 million in the past 24 hours or so. It seems like it's quite small compared to what some of these biggest platforms offer, which is about a billion dollars in trading volume. What could make you compete better with yeah. some of the, the big giants out yeah. there? Yeah, no, it's it's a it's a perfect question, right? It's essentially this 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 uh, you know. Cold start problem, right? Going from from zero to one, um, and the most important thing that we have to do as a platform is, you know, we have to we have to build awareness of what we're doing. We have to uh, allow users and help users really understand what is the difference between using a platform like this and using a lot of the other platforms out in the market. Um, for example, if you look at you know if you look at these two, let's just take two two platforms and combine them: Coinbase versus a Binance. Coinbase, uh, you know, really good kind of middle office and back office. You know, has this feeling of safety and, and security and compliance. Um, and then when you look at the product and user experience of something like a, a Binance, you know, it's very, 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 very powerful. Users like to use Binance. They like the app. What's really exciting to us is we think there is a, a you know, an opportunity in the market and a gap in the market where you're combining kind of the the user experience and product experience of something like Binance and the kind of the regulatory and safety back end of, of something like a Coinbase. So that's where we see is kind of like the really really phenomenal uh, type of marketing position um, that we could achieve. So what what are the sorts of targets that you've got in place and how many users are you aiming to sign up? I know you've got more than 20 tokens in issuance, but what's the sort of liquidity that you're aiming for as well? Yeah, that's no, great. A great question. We'll be launching. If you look at uh, the, the types of uh, tokens that are in our roadmap, if you look at you know Coinbase or you look at a, a Binance, these are exchanges that you know have you know hundreds of tokens listed. Uh, Binance also has a number of different services. So a lot of these services, a lot of these tokens uh, attract users to you know to hold their hold their assets there. Well, our our goal long long term within the next five years is we want to be the the largest uh, you know globally compliant exchange in the world. Um, the five years is a long uh, is a, a bit of a long roadmap. Uh, if you ask me, you know we we obviously internally. Uh, have you know yearly KPIs in terms of the user growth that we want to that we want to achieve? Uh, we don't publish those uh, publicly, um, but I, there's one thing that we're doing for each token that we do list. You know we have uh, liquidity providers and market makers who are there on day one to ensure that the market is deep enough. And, and resources, how much are you deploying in this effort now? Uh, this is a you know this is a huge focus of of, of Hashq Group now. Uh, Hashq Group. Uh, Back in January of this year, uh, we just closed a you know recent round. Then uh, currently, the company we we believe that we're adequately capitalized to to grow and expand this uh, over over this year and into the future. Uh, one of the nice things about being regulated in a uh, in a jurisdiction such as Bermuda is if you if you think about it, the, the Bermuda Monetary Authority is one of the largest uh, uh, reinsurance hubs in the entire world. So they have a very 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 strong awareness of. The type of capitalization requirements that are needed for for licensed institutions, because if you're an insurance company, there's a huge amount of uh, of requirements for for capitalization in order to make sure that you can you know fulfill future claims. How much uh, of a dollar amount though are you are you putting into this? Yeah, yeah, good good question. <laughs> we don't again we don't publish uh, dollar amounts okay. in terms of the capitalization of the company and capital requirements. Uh, some of the regulatory requirements are public, uh, but any of these licensing uh, licensed operations, the the regulator looks at these specific operations. But if you're aiming to be top five, could you give us more of an indication on the sorts? Of benchmarks or, or hallmarks that you're looking to yeah, to sure. reach here. The huge, I mean, there's it's very very simple in terms of business metrics. You've got you know assets under custody. That's one of the that's one of the huge metrics. You've got uh, you know daily active users, monthly active users, and then you've got you've got trading volume. Yeah. Um, so one of the first things we look at is is definitely growing the the assets that are custodied on the exchange. And back to back to Vaughn's question, right? And 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 Emil's question. In order to really um, you know get the confidence of users to store their assets on the platform. It's important that we that we spread the awareness of what does it look like to actually operate, um, you know, a licensed exchange. So, for example, an exchange like ours that's licensed, uh, we segregate client assets from company assets. So there's no commingling of client assets whatsoever. Uh, there's there's insurance that we buy on the wallets and, and and storage that we store clients' assets in. There's there's yearly annual audits that have to take place. So a lot of these things combined, you can't just bring good products and services to market. You actually have to give users confidence that. If they do store their assets in the platform, that they're safe, they're secure, and segregated from the company's assets and bankruptcy remote. So um, you're not planning on 
raising mon any more money, is it? Well, I would leave that to our, uh, our, 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 you okay. know, our CFO and, and investor relations team to look through. I mean, we're always actively you know, open to, to great investors coming in, strategic investors uh, and individual investors. Yeah. Um, so the company is currently privately, uh, privately owned, uh, and we do you know, execute funding rounds um, from time to time. Could you just give us a sense of a roadmap here? I mean, you've launched today, so w what does it exactly look like over the coming six months into the end of the year? Yeah, this is a great question. Uh, super exciting. Uh, on day one, uh, as of today, actually, literally, this is day one, uh, we're open uh, open for trading. Uh, we're launching with spot trading, which, which with several assets. I think it's between 20, 20 and 30 assets. What we'll aim to do over the next one to two months is we'll be launching uh, perpetual futures trading. Uh, and there's a number of, uh, you know. Which products? Those everything? will be, yeah, those will be, uh, because of the because of the size of the uh, of the market for USDT, uh, those are all uh, you know things like BDC, ETH to USDT pairs. So essentially, that uh, that offshore dollar market. Um, in addition to that, we'll be we'll be launching other products like uh, Launchpad, which is a you know it's it's an opportunity for new Web3 apps to to come to market and acquire users uh, by by selling a few tokens through through the platform. Uh, and then we'll also be offering uh, staking services to users. So all of that is looking you know probably within the next you know, uh, two to six months, we'll be launching those in, in phases. But, but perpetual futures, uh, most likely first. What constitutes a success in the number of sign-ups? Uh, I mean, if you look at, you know, based on your numbers there, right, you have to have, uh, you know, over the course of one year to two years, like you have to, you have, in order to keep in, compete in this space, you need millions of users on, on the platform. The way we measure uh, success, again, goes down to, you know, uh, daily active users, monthly active users, the, the assets that are on the platform. Uh, you need hundreds of, you know, you need you know, hundreds of millions, billions of assets under custody in order to generate sufficient trading volume. But obviously, it's revenue and profit from, from trading volume that derives from daily active users so and assets. So, what would be a sort of target then in terms of active users and also trading volumes? Uh, good question. Um, you know, if you look at the you know the daily active trading volume out there, uh, you know, if you look, I think last last uh, last month Coinbase International published their their trading volume for the month. I think it was you know six six billion or so. I think our first uh, our first goal would be to surpass uh, what other competitors have been doing um, in that jurisdiction. Yeah. So the first goal will be definitely surpass uh, the volume that's been generated there uh, from Coinbase International. Ben, we've got to leave it there, but thank you so much and congratulations. Ben Elbaz there, Managing Director at Hashkey Global. We're checking uh, beyond just cryptos, but really commodities and, really, and this catch-up that we're seeing across some of these uh, China-traded commodities. You take a look at how copper, aluminum, rubber, iron ore in Singapore, that's also continuing on 4.5% uh, when it comes to ore in the Lion City. But we continue to watch what goes on there. Obviously, with oil prices, certainly have been quite elevated as well. So still seeing a bit of a catch up here this morning. Uh, we got some news when it comes to Temu. Of course, this is the e-commerce uh, platform or shopping app. Uh, South Korea is now saying that they've launched an ins inspection into Temu on suspicions of the retail platform's false advertising and other unfair business practices. This is according to officials uh, at the antitrust regulator. So the FTC recently sent documents to the company for a probe to see if it violates South Korea's e-commerce acts and advertisement regulations by making false and exaggerated advertisements. Of course, Temu is operated by Ping Duo Duo, which is listed in the U.S., but we'll check more on that once we do get any more details. We've got plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Here's your China Brief, a look at some stories making headlines in the local Chinese papers and what's trending on social media. Let's start with how state media is covering, of course, Janet Yellen's visit to Beijing. The Treasury Secretary, of course, still awaiting news of them, her meeting the PBOC governor here today, as well as the Elhe. The Xinhua News Agency focusing on Premier Li Chang's call for the U.S. to abide by market economy norms and refraining from turning economic and trade issues into political ones and view the issue of China's production capacity objectively so still bring up those concerns when it comes over capacity which we talked about has you know they've barked back by that according to uh, local media all right securities daily is doing this here right now so they're citing some experts out there that the real estate market continued to face pressure during the Qingming festival holiday despite sales promotions and favorable government policies now citing analysts out there it says there's still room for various regions to optimize their property policies speaking
speaking of property, Weibo users are discussing a reported drop in China's housing loans. That's according to local media. We've heard from five state-owned banks now that have been talking about declines in personal mortgage loans by the end of 2023. Many users have been sharing stories about what it's like borrowing when interest rates were high, only to end up with their homes not getting delivered. Some more reactions for you. The banks may have earned a little less, but people's lives aren't really getting better. Properties rental to sale ratio has gotten too high. What's the point of buying anymore? And also people don't want to live on loans anymore. An attitude that is here to stay. Certainly there's a lot in focus across markets when it comes to these developers here today. Sure, Mao certainly uh, sent some traders, I guess, a little bit off guard given these news about CCB filing this winding up petition in Hong Kong. Uh, you take a look at Sure, Mao, that one's down, but the rest of the property developers are actually doing okay. Hang Seng is doing this here right now. We're really kind of bucking this regional trend of upside. Uh, Greater China coming back also on the back foot as well.